Wonderful to have you here, Raywin, and such a, uh, an occasion when we can talk about really important matters to do with the state of education today. Mm, How you. do you see um, the, the, the challenges and the global conversations that we should be having mm, about we, education? We really need to have. Well, first of all, I think we need to talk about teachers and talk much more intelligently about teachers than uh, a lot of the current media discussion. Um, we need to think of teaching as a, a complex kind of job, a really demanding kind of work, uh, one that needs pretty careful preparation if it's going to be done well. And we need to get a long way beyond the current, you know, quick and dirty ideas about how to prepare teachers which are not doing education any good at all. That's one thing. Um, another thing is that we need to think about the, the way we test and assess kids. Um, and their learning. Um, there's a great wave of um, quantitative testing, uh, formalised testing going around the world at the moment, encouraged by both governments and corporations which make a lot of money out of it. Um, and again, I think this is very short-sighted uh, approach to understanding kids' learning and measuring outcomes. Uh, something that narrows the curriculum, that narrows the kids' learning, creates anxieties, creates divisions among kids when we have a hell of a lot of high-stakes competitive testing in the, in, the, uh, in the education system. And the third thing that we really need to think about much more carefully is how we resource education. Um, there's, again, been a, a wave of privatisation of at least certain areas of education, technical education, increasingly higher education now, and to some extent school education, where we've tried to shift, or more exactly governments have tried to shift the cost of education onto families. And that again is a net solution in the short term for budget problems, but a very serious problem in the longer term. Um, if we're, as a result of that, underfunding some of the most crucial areas of the education system, which I think is happening at the moment. Um, and that includes education for disadvantaged groups uh, on a global scale, uh, as well as within individual countries. We're underfunding higher education very seriously at the moment. Um, and, and basically we've produced, a, or we're on the way to producing, uh, an education system which is essentially dependent on market fashions and the search for profit uh, rather than the purposes of education itself and the social goods that might come from education. So I wonder what you see as at stake because what you've described actually is mm -hmm. the model that many of the organisations like the OECD Indeed. propose as yes. the solution but what's quite at stake if we run forward yeah. with this model? Yeah. Well, the quality of education, the breadth of knowledge that our education systems include and, and teach, um, and the social effects of education too. As one of the consequences of high stakes uh, testing, combined with private provision, which is of course always more available to privileged groups, is an increasing level of social division in uh, among kids and in the educational process generally. Now there's always been social division in education. I mean, mass school systems were born segregated. They were segregated by race, they're segregated by gender, they're segregated by social class. And for a hundred years, you know, educators struggled to abandon, to, to break down the apartheid of school systems and create common learning, shared curricula, and socially just outcomes. And now we seem to have gone into a complete reverse and we're heading at a great rate of knots back to the 19th century in, uh, in public policy and education. It's actually quite extraordinary. Um, the, uh, the effects of the, the dominant policy model that's being, uh, as you say, uh, promoted you know, not just within local school systems, but on a global scale by institutions like the OECD. I find it quite, you know, quite remarkable that senior policy makers would be so irresponsible. 
and, and yet so committed to this model. And and I'm, I'm, well, I'm yes, I'm, yeah. and I'm wondering if you, as you go around the world, um, and look at uh, you know, are there alternatives? You know, sh what other conversations about what alternate ways of thinking mm. do you see that yeah. we could think about? Well, one of the the alternatives is simply critical thinking within the existing system to become much more aware of the consequences of this and the damaging effect on the quality of school life and classroom life of, of this kind of policy regime. Uh, so that the people who make the policies and, um, as you say, promote the general ideology and are often very committed and honestly committed to the ideology are not the people doing the work in classrooms. Uh, most teachers don't want over-testing regimes. Most teachers don't want the system to be privatised. They feel they're in their work in order to do a good job in the interests of society. I mean, that's the fundamental outlook of most working teachers. And that is, unfortunately, at the moment, not influencing you know, the policy of major players in, in, in the business. But there are, you know, there are different ways of... Um, of setting up the institutional pattern of education. We don't have to have an education system where universities are forced to compete with each other, where schools are scratching at each other's you know, faces in order to get um, you know, privileged and, and affluent families to buy their services. We don't have to do this. Um, we actually know how to make good schools and make them run well. Uh, we know, you know, uh, how to get community involvement. We know what motivates teachers, by and large. Broadly speaking, we know how to get kids learning. Um, but we don't resource that knowledge. We don't build that into dominant policy models. And therefore, it doesn't happen a lot of the time. Um, and we also know... I think increasingly, though this is more novel, this is newer on the education scene, how to broaden the kind of knowledge that gets into school systems. Because the, the competitive um, model of education is built actually on a fairly narrow curriculum framework, on a fairly narrow idea of what constitutes real knowledge and how we educate around knowledge. Um, and in, as a matter of fact, there is, you know, there are a wide range of forms of knowledge in the world. Um, <clears throat> there are alternative forms of knowledge. Uh, some of them, you know, socially very important. And I'm not now, when I talk about alternative forms of knowledge, I'm not thinking of New Age stuff where we make up our own religion. But uh, the kind of knowledge, for instance, that's embedded in communities who work in the informal economy, uh, around the edges of the mainstream um, economic system. And in many parts of the world, that's a good half of the population we're talking about. The kind of knowledge that they generate and need uh, for economic survival, for social solidarity and so forth, are forms of knowledge and embodying problems around which we can build really good, relevant, meaningful education programs. So we can diversify curriculum. We know how to do this if we can get the policy space and the public support to do it. So that's a wonderful point at which we can um, finish this conversation. That's a, a big challenge, but an important challenge. Indeed Thank you, Raymond Connell. Thank you very much. Thank you.